So we'll get started in just a couple minutes here at Okay, good evening. Um, welcome to uh, SJAA Astro Imaging Workshop. Uh, I'm Glenn Newell and I head the hands-on imaging program for, for SJAA, one of two imaging programs that we have and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, first of all, uh, get situated with a couple things here. Uh, for optimal viewing of this, um, let me ditch the camera for a second here. Uh, we recommend two things. Uh, one, if you can use the the dark theme in uh, YouTube, uh, that'll help you. Uh, there won't be such bright contrast to shine against slides and, and other things that, that I'm showing. So that'll help. And then also, uh, I'm, uh, I guess there's one word here that's not highlighted. Um, we recommend that you use at least 720p. Uh, that's what I'm streaming at. And we'll see if that's good enough for small fonts in astro imaging programs or not. And uh, maybe next time I'll try uh, 1080p and see if I have enough bandwidth and all compute power to, to stream at uh, in HD. Okay. Uh, oh, also in the YouTube, there's a, a chat window on the right hand side. And if you have questions, you can uh, type them in there and I will hopefully see them and uh, respond at, at some point. Okay. Let me go back here for a second. Um, so normally uh, I have these events in person at uh, Little Uvis Open Space Preserve in uh, Morgan Hill. And uh, I do that two times in a quarter. And then the third month in the quarter is a, a private event for club members. SJAA members uh, where we actually, rather than me give a lecture and, and demonstrate things, we'll have them actually be hands-on either with their equipment or with club equipment. And I'll just be there to, to help and give tips. And there'll be other club members there uh, that are doing their own imaging, but they're always uh, nice and willing to um, help out, excuse me, and uh, so it's it's a it's a good time, but that's a that's a uh, members only event, and we'll talk about membership in a minute. 
Uh, let's see, what else? So yeah, so normally these workshops that I do out at Little Uvis, um, we arrive at sunset. Uh, I give a lecture until it's dark enough to see Polaris. It's usually about an hour. And uh, then we go on to demonstrate some deep space or other types of uh, nighttime photography. Um, so since we can't do that, I'm, I'm going to do similar. I'm going to talk for about an hour, and then uh, we'll, if the weather holds, uh, we'll, we'll do, some <laughs> do some demonstration of uh, live, live imaging um, after, the, after the talk. And uh, for this, this month, what I wanted to talk about was, uh, you know, I started posting videos on my YouTube channel uh, about a year after I started in the hobby. So I started in 2014. So in 2015, I started posting uh, videos about how to do astroimaging. And um, it's, been a, it's been a while since I've uh, posted, posted new ones. Um, and I, I wanted to kind of cover things that have changed in, in the interim. So tonight's lecture is all about, you know, hey, if you watched my videos from 2015, what would you be missing or what would you need to know that's different or things that I've learned in the meantime? So that's what tonight's lecture is about. And um, we, can, we can go ahead and dive in here, I guess. But first... Uh, there will be a brief talk about uh, SJAA. Let me hide my window again here, switch it to the side. Oops, that one, not that one. Okay. And I've still got that one up, this one. All right, so now you can see the QR code. So, so I have tried to put in this. Um, let me just fix one small thing here. I don't know why this guy's on. Okay. Um, everywhere that I have links in this presentation, I've tried to put QR codes. So you should be able to hold your smartphone up to the screen there, and that'll be easier than. Um, scribbling down, trying to write down all the letters in a in a URL or whatever. So, San Jose Astronomical Association. We have two main websites that we use to communicate with people. So, our our own website is sja.net, and then all of our public events are posted on Meetup. And you all probably RSVP'd there, so you know about that. But anyway, uh, it's you know there's uh, 14, 1,500 members uh, at uh, meetup.com uh, slash sj-astronomy. Okay, so those are the what the two websites look like. And, uh, you know, on the club website, there's some things like uh, the listings of the programs that we have and uh, some observing sites. And so you might want to just go through the the tabs here when you get a chance on that site. So with this whole COVID thing, um, we're you know trying to do more and more online stuff. Let me turn off this guy here again. So. Um, as we get online, we're, we've got stuff kind of spread around. So we're working on, on getting just one uh, web, we're one YouTube channel for, for SJA. So at the moment, there's, you know, these four, and, but we're consolidating down to, to one. So anything that's uh, purely SJAA, you know, I'll copy from my channel to the SJAA channel and vice versa. Uh, and then these other channels uh, will all consolidate under this SJ Astronomy at some point in the next uh, month or so. Okay, so those are the YouTube channels.
So SJAA is a nonprofit uh, based in San Jose, and uh, we do a whole bunch of stuff. We, we like to say we're a hyperactive club. Uh, normally, <laughs> we have uh, a number of at least three star parties each month, if not more. Uh, two we call in-town star parties at, at uh, Hoagie Park in, in San Jose, Los Altos, or Los Gatos border. Um, and then uh, there's another one at Rancho Canada de Oro, which is near where I do my events uh, down in uh, Morgan Hill. And we have uh, programs for people that are just starting out in the observing side of the hobby, we call it Quick Start. We have a telescope loaner program, so you can find out if you're really interested or not and what type of equipment uh, interests you before you go out and, and spend money, which is always a good thing. And then we do school star parties. Uh, once a month after our board meeting, we have uh, speakers come in from, from NASA and SETI and other places uh, and give a, a lecture. Uh, we have an intro to the night sky class. We have uh, a library with uh, books and magazines on stuff. We have two astrophotography programs. Uh, one is the, the Imaging Special Interest Group, and um, that's uh, uh, either a lecture specific on astrophotography or a group discussion and people sharing their, their astro images and that type of thing. And then I do the, the hands-on uh, stuff, uh, as I mentioned earlier, workshops and, and the club private uh, field clinics out at Little uh, Uvis Open Space Preserve. OK, uh, we have a couple swap meets a year, which is really great place to sell and buy uh, gear. And then I mentioned the Rancho Canada de Oro. And we also have, once a month, we have solar observing at uh, Hoagie Park. Uh, that's another thing that we're, we're doing online now. Um, and then we have a telescope fix-it sessions on that same Sunday as the solar observing. So if you've got something wrong with your telescope or you just need some help, uh, you can sign up to get to get help during during that time. And then for the club members, we have club private viewing. Uh, you know, we have a few dark sites that we have permission to to go in and uh, privately have uh, club private imaging there. Okay, so let's get into tonight's topic. And again, um, if you come up with a question or something, you can just type it in the YouTube chat, and I'll try to keep an eye on that and uh, answer it at the appropriate time. So tonight's topic, again, uh, you know, you, you can see here on the upper right-hand corner, um, this is what my rig looked like in the early part of 2015. You know, it's a DSLR on an 8-inch uh, RC with the Orion Sirius mount and, you know, laptop and a bunch of cables and, and uh, you know, whatnot. And uh, then going, jumping fast forward to today, this is the, the rig today. Uh, so you know what all have I have I learned along the way, and what has changed, and uh, what do I need to share with you? So we'll talk about uh, the importance of the mount. I try to hit that in in every lecture, especially before you go out and spend any money. We need to talk about <laughs> the mount. Um, talk about what's changed in in polar alignment, auto guiding. Uh, you know, in 2015, uh, we were using manual focusers and batten off masks, and we'll talk about, you know, the next steps in, in that. Uh, in 2015, we had uh, DSLRs and uh, CCDs were, were out of the budget, at least for me. Uh, so we had uh, modified DSLRs for, for astro imaging, and, but now we have dedicated uh, and cooled CMOS astro cameras. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about all the gear that I've blown up along the way trying to use long uh, USB cables and, and some tips. And if you're going to do that, you know, how to maybe avoid that. But there's uh, both mechanical and electrical problems that, that can occur that can damage gear. So I want to make you aware of that. And then uh, 
imaging software, image acquisition software. We'll talk about planning software briefly mentioned, uh, and uh, we'll we'll talk about you know what my rig is here that we're going to be using tonight, and then we'll do the demo. So that's the plan. And speaking of which, let's check the see if the weather has been updated. So it looks like we're still good in the early part of the of the evening here. This is, you know, there's lots of astronomical uh, observing weather sites. Uh, this is one that that I use uh, clear outside. And um, besides their view here, we are also checking for humidity. That's going to be the problem is if we get fog rolling in here, but hopefully uh, it won't happen until after we're done. Okay. All right, so first topic, it's still all about the mount. The mount is the most important part of an astroimaging uh, rig, not the camera, not the, the telescope. The mount is the most important thing. So keep that, keep that in mind. Um, and the reason for that is because, you know, you're trying to, to track things uh, that are very small and very far away, uh, small in terms of the, the angle on the sky. Let me turn my webcam back on here. And why I keep getting that frame back. Okay. Um, so briefly, uh, angles on the sky. Um, Stars wiggle around because of the atmosphere. That's what they, 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 we say they twinkle, but it's really the atmosphere moving around. And typically for amateur astronomy, meaning, you know, the sites that, that you have that haven't been picked by professional astronomers that have laminar flow off the, you know, up the mountain over the observatory site, uh, you're going to have at best, you know, like a two arc second scene. So what's an arc second? So 360 degrees in a circle, 60 arc minutes in a degree, 60 arc seconds in an arc minute. So an arc second is pretty pretty small. In fact, if you took a golf ball and you held it up, okay, you know how big a golf ball is. If you move that now, you know, 5.6 miles away, nine kilometers away, that's how big an arc second is on the sky and because the best scene that you're going to probably get is around the order of two arc seconds we want to sample our stars at you know one arc second so uh, Nyquist theorem sampling theorem right so that's we're trying to be like one arc second accurate uh, you know with with mass mass market mounts right so that's the that's the challenge uh, and that's what why the mount really makes the the difference that's why you need arc second accuracy so you should plan on spending you know 70 75 percent uh, of your budget on the mount and that'll keep you from buying multiple mounts you know you might uh, like I did, like a lot of people do, you know, you don't know what you're doing. You get a catalog or something. I literally got a, a catalog of, uh, of of things, a paper catalog, and picked a, a telescope and a and it came with a mount. And of course, that lasted, you know, about three weeks or something. And then I realized I needed a better mount. So we want to avoid that. Um, so. You know, there, there's lots of brands of, of mounts. We happen to be near where Orion uh, is in, in Watsonville, California, and they have. We're fortunate to have a, a store. Uh, a lot of places don't have telescope stores. We have a one Orion store in Cupertino. Um, 
so the minimum mount that that I would recommend for astrophotography is the Orion Atlas Pro. Now there's uh you know that's in a certain sense uh, an OEM right so it comes in other brands uh Skywatcher um etc but that 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 set of features uh is like the minimum and um it's it's really going to make a huge difference in your enjoyment of the hobby right because if you're fighting oblong stars and wiggly stars and then you're just not going to have uh, a good time and it's just so much smoother when you're not fighting with your with your mount it really makes a big difference so again yeah the the atlas pro or skywatcher equivalent um, uh, you know you can do the research if you want to iopteron or whatever and get the equivalent uh, mount but you know some of the thinking behind this one is, you know, it's belt drive. It's, you know, the least expensive mount, I think, with that comes with belt drive versus trying to upgrade ones with gears. Uh, and uh, it's pretty heavy duty. And it can be, you know, all these mass produced mounts are only going to be so good, right? But you can, uh, if you're mechanically inclined or if you want to pay somebody to quote hyper tune. Uh, there's literally a place you can send your mount and have it hypertuned, and, and uh, Deep Space Products is, is that place. Or he sells a DVD that you know tells you how to do it. Um, you can you know you can improve that even further, and uh, you get a lot of bang for the the buck out of uh, doing that that upgrade. Uh, other than that, it has a lot of upgrades from the next model down, which is the the Atlas. Um, and it's not that much heavier than uh, the model below that one, which is the, the Sirius. Uh, yes, it's a lot heavier if you're going to be lugging it up a trail or something, but just in terms of moving it from a car to, to where you're observing, uh, it's not that much heavier. Okay. One thing I, I've learned in all the different mounts that I've played with is uh, some of them come with a leg pointing outward to the north, and some of them put that leg pointing backwards to the south. And it actually makes a difference. And for me, uh, I'm not sure why they have it to the south. I think maybe it's uh, they think there's better clearance if you have a really long uh, refractor or something. But what what can happen is if you have a leg on the south side uh, when you're setting the mount up you need to put the counterweights on before you put the 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 scope on and i, I may say uh, ota when i'm referring to a telescope it, it means optical uh, optical tube assembly i believe when you put your you, you want to put the weights on first because if you if you put your scope on without the counterweights and your clutches aren't tight the whole thing can flip over um, so that's bad so you got to put the counterweights on first but if you've got uh, no leg out in front you've got these counterweights hanging out over nothing uh, before you put the scope on it's it's unbalanced right and could could tip over so that's why i like to have a a leg uh to the on the north side and uh, all the mounts that i've seen anyway uh, consumer level mounts anyway, you can move this bolt. I've got my mouse on the wrong screen here. You can move this bolt, uh, which controls how the, the head aligns with the, with the tripod. And, uh, that way you can change the, the orientation of the, the leg. So I recommend doing that if yours comes with the leg pointing south. Okay. Another thing I've learned that, that's uh, kind of interesting, uh, a little bit of math. Um, so, you know, where if if you've got uh, multiple counterweights or you've got counterweights of different sizes, you know, how do you how do you put them on there to balance things? So, you know, I, just without any deep thought, I used to think that well, it's better to have. Uh, a counterweight, you know, farther, farther out, 
and that way you can use a smaller counterweight uh, and you'd have less total weight on the on the right ascension bearings of the mount and that sort of makes sense but it turns out to be totally wrong <laughs> uh, because there's this thing called uh, angular momentum and angular momentum goes with the square of the distance uh, not uh, just the linear distance so that's uh, why that's a, a, a misconception. So um, this comes from um, plane wave, or astrophysics, sorry, astrophysics puts this out. And uh, they're telling you, you know, what you want to do is, is you want to have all your weight uh, up close to the scope, uh, and then you have a smaller counterweight that you can slide back and forth to, to kind of balance things out. And I, I actually... You know they explain the math here, but I actually did it on a on a spreadsheet and and tried a few different things, and it's it's right. It's always less total momentum that your mount has to overcome uh, if you keep your counterweights up close to the to the mount, even even if you have more of them because they're closer to the mount. Uh, it's it's better. You get better tracking, better auto guiding. With that situation so that's that's an interesting thing and then you know sometimes you see pictures of of uh, people setups or or you see uh, at remote observatories or something setups and you'll see that some people have the counterweights all down at the end and some people have them up by the mount so some some people know about this and some people don't so anyway that's what we need to do okay and then uh Here's another topic is uh, periodic error correction. Um, some mounts offer periodic error correction. And uh, in this case, uh, the mount driver that we use with those Araya, Orion, Cinta, Skywatcher mounts is, is EQMod. It's free software. And it also supports the recording and playing back of uh, periodic error correction. So this helps figure out, uh, you know, some of the the uh, inaccuracies in, in your mount due to due to gears or or grease or you know whatever it is. And you can, while you're auto guiding, you can record this and then play it back, and th it'll make the the next time, and that'll make your auto guider uh, not have to work so hard, and you'll have a smoother uh, result. Um, so I'm not going to go into the into the gory details here, but yeah, basically you just auto guide on on a star, and uh, you record uh, five to seven cycles of your worm gear, and and this dialog here will help you set that up, and then uh, it'll just you save that file, and it'll just play it back. And in uh, EQ Mod, right down here, when it tells you what tracking rate it's at, it'll say uh, sidereal plus peck instead of just sidereal when you've got the the uh, periodic error correction going there. Um, it can also be stored in the mount controller in some mounts. I had uh, always assumed it was it was part of the handset, and it and it may be. In uh, perhaps in some mounts, but in in the uh, Cinta Orion uh, Skywatcher, at least you know the, these models or their equivalents, uh, you can store it in the the uh, mount itself without without the handset. And we tend to try to avoid using the the handset when we're when we're astro imaging. It's just one more piece of gear that we don't need to to have involved uh, and in the newer versions of EQ mod there's a, there is a way to uh, to enable uh, storing it in the mount itself okay so let's move on to polar alignment techniques so what what's changed since I recorded videos in 2015 Well, the the whiz bang uh, easiest way to do it is uh, to use 
the QHY Pull Master. Now this does mean you're buying yet another camera to put on your, your mount, so you would essentially have three cameras probably, right? A guiding camera, an imaging camera, and now this thing. Um, but it really does make it quick and easy. And uh, if you were trying to use a polar scope before, you know, you don't have to get down on your knees. And I was always fumbling with my glasses and hurting my knees and all this stuff uh, to look through those those polar scopes. Um, so this is a, a really nice way to go. And there's, you know, you can find lots of videos on YouTube about how to use these, but they, they really make it uh, simple. You just follow the, the on-screen instructions. Um, so there's that. Um, if you don't want to buy another camera, you could spend less money on a SharpCat Pro license, and that lets you use your, your guide camera, uh, but you need to have a, a guide scope that's 200 millimeters or less in focal length for that to be effective. So if you've got a short tube 80, that's, that's like 400 millimeters, that's too long. Uh, but some of the smaller guide scopes you'd be okay and of course you can't use an off-axis guider or an on-axis guider because your focal length is way longer at that point than you know 200 millimeters but that's a that's an option uh, as well for for easy polar alignment and of course sharp cap does a lot more than just polar alignment it's a complete uh, image acquisition software package although i i think it's geared more towards planetary than than deep space but they keep adding features um so you can explore that but it's, it's really good for planetary all right auto guiding what's changed in auto guiding well phd2 keeps getting better and uh, it is still pretty much the uh, you know most popular auto guiding software and it's free so you can't complain about that i think the best thing you could do though to to learn about how to use it is to read this uh, best practices document that they have and uh, so here's the here's the link and you should go through that and it tells you, you know, where in the sky should you do your calibration and lots of other tips that you might have not been aware of. So that's a good thing. And then, you know, what I've learned along the way kind of in, in the journey of improving your, your auto guiding, a lot of people start with a, a little rig like this. Uh, maybe a 50 millimeter guide scope in, in uh, diameter. And, uh, you know, uh, this is a popular Orion Starshoot auto guider camera. Um, and unfortunately, you might have even started with this cable that they give you to go from the camera to the, to the mount, which is not what you want to do. You want to use ASCOM pulse guiding, which uses the, the USB. Uh, and the advantage of that is that that way the mount, or I'm sorry, that way PHD2 knows where in the sky the mount is pointing and it can um, be more effective at uh, doing its job uh, because it's integrated with, uh, with ASCOM. Uh, versus using this this relay uh, cable here, the ST4 cable. Okay. Uh, other things that that you can do, you know, is get a bigger get a bigger guide scope that's closer to the focal length of your um, whatever your telescope is. Uh, you know, there's a a 60 millimeter diameter, 200 millimeter. Uh, focal length from Orion that's that's popular and again that that would work with uh, sharp cap for polar alignment um, and then a really popular guide scope is Orion short tube 80 which they stopped making for a while now they have it back I think and iopteron and other people have similar um, you know I think it's 400 and 
80 millimeter focal length for memory and 80 millimeter diameter. Uh, and too, too long a focal length to do the polar alignment, but you know, it's a lot of aperture and uh, a lot of focal length for, for a guide scope. And then with that, people generally go to a, a smaller uh, pixel size, uh, more pixels, smaller pixels camera with that. Uh, one thing I'm remembering to tell you, you know, if you go and buy a short tube 80 by itself, uh, it's not going to have a piece that you need. See how long this extension is here out to the camera? It doesn't come with, with that extension. So to come to focus with, with the camera, you need to buy a little piece of extension as well. Um, excuse me. Uh, another thing is that oftentimes you'll see guide scopes with these uh, three adjustment screws on the scope rings, and that kind of seems like a good idea maybe to get your uh, scope lined up with your your main scope, which is actually not that important if you're if you're imaging. Uh, but what it can cause is uh, differential flexure. You know, it's not a it's not a super strong mechanical arrangement if one of those screws is not tight. Uh, so if you can, you want to get scope rings that fit exactly your guide scope and not use those adjustable ones. So that'll help. And I mentioned, uh, you know, better guide camera, uh, Orion Starshoot Auto Guider Pro, QHY 5L2. Those are actually the same camera, just different firmware. Uh, then CWO, um, they have uh, a couple different mini uh, cameras that, that are, you know, one and a quarter inch form factor. Uh, ASI 1290 would be a, a, a good one. Um, and then if you're super serious, there's, there's ASI 1, 174, uh, which has um, bigger pixels and, and uh, a pretty big chip, depending on, uh, I talk about it down here in the off axis. Um, depending on the size of your prism because it doesn't make sense to get a camera sensor that's bigger than your your prism in your this little guy here in your off-axis guide or if you're going to go off-axis uh yeah so that's that's the next another step or another approach to guiding is to use an off-axis guider rather than a separate guide scope and then you don't have to worry about differential flexure uh, at all um, but there are some challenges. You know, you have to arrange this thing so that your your guide camera up here and your imaging camera off the back, uh, you know, come to focus at the same point because they're both sitting after the after the focus, right? So they have to be par focal. And then another thing you need to be aware of now, if you go and rotate your camera to get a different orientation. Uh, you know, with with a separate guide scope, it, it it doesn't matter if you rotate your imaging camera because it doesn't affect your guiding because you're guiding with a different telescope and camera. In in this case, if you rotate uh, your your imaging camera, uh, if you know, and that may cause you to rotate your off-axis guider, in which case you've changed the orientation of the guide camera against the sky, and you have to re uh, calibrate your uh, PhD2 if you do that. Uh, if, however, you have a mechanical or electric or however you want to say it, uh, a rotator uh, that's got an ASCOM driver, then uh, PhD2 will keep track of that and you don't have to, to recalibrate. Um, so that's one one of the things, one of the projects I did in this last year was build a rotator. Okay, and then another challenge is, so you're, you, you know, you've got this little prism or what have you, so you may have trouble finding finding guide stars. So that's that's a challenge with off-axis guiders. Okay, we talked about the ASI 174. Um, there is this other 
breed of, of off-axis, or they call it on-axis guiding, uh, which is kind of a whole topic in itself. And uh, that works. You can see there's a mirror in here, but it's a what's called a cold mirror because the colder light, the visible light, bounces off the mirror and comes out this top piece. But the infrared light goes right through that mirror and you put your guide camera on the back. So it's guiding in the infrared, which has some advantages. Uh, you can guide lower to the horizon and, and uh, less turbulence and stuff with infrared. Uh, and also, uh, there's a, a optical aberration that happens because your, your infrared light is coming through this mirror at a 45 degree angle. Uh, it has astigmatism. But it turns out, if you if you know what you're doing, then you can use that astigmatism to figure out if you're in focus or not, in which way you're out of focus. So part of the whole purpose of this onag thing is that uh, with some more software, you can watch the shape of the guide star and use that to keep everything in focus in in real time constantly. And that's uh, what I'm doing on my on my rig and, and we'll show that a little later on um, but this is not the type of thing that you just you know wake up on a sunday or a cloudy night or whatever and and pull the trigger you know this takes a lot of planning there's a lot of especially if you're going to use a focal reducer um, and that's why i say this is a whole lecture uh in in itself so don't don't you really have to plan this carefully and check for all the clearances of all the gear around this thing and back focus and all types of stuff. So, um, but those are, those are ways to improve your auto guiding. Okay. Then, uh, so focusing. So, you know, if we go back to that 2015 rig, it was, it was totally manual focusing probably looked something like, this here without the without the motor and so you uh you know at the beginning of the night you'd go to a bright star and put a batten off mask on and manually focus uh and then you know maybe every few hours or something you know if there's temperature change or whatever you would reach recheck your your focus um but that means that you know once you once you go to bed you can't leave the thing running and and you know if the temperature is going to change or its filters are going to change and and the focus needs to change you're not going to be there to do it so that means you need to stay up or you know not not change the focus so the next step in the in the hobby you know is to then add some motorized control to your focuser and then once you have that with software then we can do things like autofocus and um, you know, check the focus uh, periodically and and correct it if if it's goes out because of temperature or because of a filter change or or whatever it is. So, you know, there may be uh, some add-on kit like this is an add-on kit for the focuser that that came with uh, the the RC telescopes that, that I've used, um, and that's from this. Uh, uh, jump down here Rigel sys company and I've got the QR codes on the next on the next slide um, and there's and there's others other brands as well uh, and then you could also you know build your own with a stepper motor and some belts and pulleys and gears or what have you uh, if you want to do that uh, I determined that the least expensive then uh, electronics that you can buy ready to go with an ASCOM controller is out of the Ukraine. And that's this uh, uh, Focus Dream Pro here. Uh, of course, you can also build that part yourself as well. You could use an Arduino uh, and then there's some code out on the on the net to make a ASCOM uh, driver for that. And I've said ASCOM a whole bunch of times, but I might not have explained what, what ASCOM is just a, a software standard, uh, was only for Windows, and now it's starting to, to branch out a little bit using uh, um, 
remote. You can you can have ASCOM still on Windows somewhere, but you can have the actual devices on on Linux or or a Raspberry Pi or something remotely and still use those. Um, so that's that's what that ASCOM thing is all about. There's another standard called Indy, which is getting real popular, which is free and open source, and uh, that's also cross-platform. So, um, so that's what that's what the ASCOM was. Uh, let's see. Um, you can also, so uh, you know, a lot of us made uh, some kind of autofocuser for camera lenses with a a belt or some other friction device that would turn the body of the lens uh, with a with a motor. Um, but now there's a company that makes uh, a device that sits between your camera and a camera lens, uh, and it will use the the motor in the lens, just like you autofocus with your lens on a DSLR. Now you can autofocus with that lens on an Astro camera. Um, so that uh, that's nice, and they have them for Canon and Nikon lenses or lens mounts, All right? Okay, and then of course, um, you know, you can just buy a whole professional grade focuser with, uh, you know, built-in motor and all of that. So Moonlight is a popular company for that. Uh, I noticed as I was talking here that I skipped past, past this first bullet. So going all the way back up to when we were using Batonoff masks, uh, one of the things I've learned in the meantime is if you are using a camera lens, uh, that you know the the Batonoff mask. You know I had tried to print some on a transparency and and tried to you know buy some that were made out of the normal Batonoff thick black material um, just notice my uh, webcam has frozen here let me take care of that while we chat um, so in the in the meantime uh, I found just gonna start this back up here Okay. Uh, in the in the meantime, I found that uh, there's a laser etched uh, batten off mask uh, that really works well, and because none of those other solutions that I was describing worked well for camera lenses, because the the plastic uh, was just too too thick for the the lines on the batten off mask were just too thick. Uh, to be effective, and you really needed a, a really fine grained for the smaller diameters of a camera lens. So anyway, this uh, Sharp Star uh, Lonely Spec is the is the way to go there. Okay. All right. So here's I promised there'd be QR codes for that slide. So again, uh, here's the the Lonely Spec. Uh, URL with the Q QR code and uh, Rigel Sys and the Focus Stream Pro. Uh, you can Google for the, if you want to build uh, Arduino, um, you can Google for that. And uh, here's the Astro Mechanics, is the people that make the camera lens focuser. And then uh, Moonlight, you know, is one popular focuser company if you want to buy everything uh, professional grade um, focuser with the motor and, and all of that. So what can you do once you've got that, you know, controlled with a motor? So now you can you can autofocus. So we're showing here, you know, in Sequence Generator Pro is one popular uh, imaging program uh, these days. There are quite a few to choose from, and at some point they're all going to do what's called a V curve. Uh, it's a way to to autofocus. So what's happening here is uh, it's going to you know move your focuser out to a certain point 
and then take a picture and figure out how big that star is and then give you a, a relative uh, number that is the quality of the focus and then it'll move the focuser in a little bit and it'll keep going and ideally you'd want to have this v-curve right so you're you're out of focus on the outside and then you move through a uh, focus and back out the other side and then they can do some math here and and predict exactly where the center of your your focus is so that's called a v-curve and um, i guess we could get into uh, uh in a in a deeper lecture we could get into you know well, what if you don't have a v what if you have a j and what if you have jaggies and all that stuff but um this is what when things are working good this is what what a v good v curve looks like so now that you can you can autofocus right so you can you could set it up you could do it you know every hour or every half an hour uh, you could most of these focusers come with uh, a temperature uh, or I guess you could you could go buy a, a temperature device um, that can be read by software but uh, you know you could say well, you could figure out well I know I need to move my focuser this much every five degrees or every one degree or you could just say we'll do an autofocus every time the temperature changes by a whole degree or something uh, or you know maybe your filters require different different focus for different filters um, so when the filter changes you could do an autofocus uh, depending on the type of scope you have and how solid your rig is after you do a meridian flip you might want to check your focus etc uh, and then of course we talked about the the on egg has this real-time continuous focus capability um, so that's another in that case you don't even have to mess with the v curves and and all of that okay so I mentioned at the top, um, you know, one of the big changes since 2015 and is the the availability of cooled CMOS astro cameras. So again, at the time, your choices were, you know, an astro modified DSLR or a CCD camera. CCD cameras are real expensive. DSLRs less so, uh, but they're not optimized for astronomy they're not cooled out of the box anyway um, and so you had to and they weren't even you know they had to be modified for for astronomy to to get more of the the h alpha get more of the infrared light um, so you had to to modify your your dslr um, and so those were the those were the choices but since then uh, there's now uh, gosh I don't know eight nine ten camera manufacturers that are offering essentially the same sensors that are in either DSLRs or security cameras CMOS um, but you know they're dedicated for astronomy and the firmware has been changed for astronomy and they're cooled um, and that makes a huge difference in the in the amount of noise that you get in your in your photos so that's really been uh, a game changer without having to go all the way to the cost of a of a CCD and there's a longer story about you know the manufacturers are are stopped making CCDs so CMOS is really the the future anyway um, so there there you have it I guess uh, so let's see did I already talk about all of this so yeah CMOS astro camera is less expensive than CCD uh, they're available in mono or color and the mono is important uh, if you want to do you know the Hubble palette if you want to take pictures of nebula with narrow band filters uh, which is which is my passion right um, you really need a mono camera and with the DSLR they were only available in color unless you literally took the thing apart and scraped off this Bayer matrix which is the thing that's on top of the sensors are really all monochrome but they put a little a, a matrix of red green and blue filters in front of the pixels on a sensor and make it into a color 
a sensor that way. And uh, I, I actually did have a, a DSLR that was where somebody had, I'd, I'd be too afraid to do it, but somebody had modified it by scraping off this bare matrix uh, to make it, make it monochrome. But now you can buy monochrome CMOS cameras. Um, as I said, they're cooled. You know, people, I had a whole complicated ice water cooling thing uh, for my DSLRs. Uh, other people use the, the thermoelectric coolers. Um, and, you know, you have to, how do you get the cold into the camera and how do you keep it from doing over when it's cold and all that stuff. So it's a whole, it was a whole process. But now you can buy something already uh, ready to go. So that's good. And, uh, you know, they're, I said the firmware is different too. So they're, they're set up uh, specifically for some of this Astro stuff that we want to do in terms of doing a, a region of interest with faster frame rate for planetary and uh, gain and uh, offset and, and whatnot for, for deep space. Um, and uh, uh, an interesting thing is, you know, some of these are available with, with smaller sensors than a DSLR. And it turns out that that actually has some advantages uh, in terms of cost. And um, so like a really popular camera is this ASI uh, 1600. So it's a, a three quarter inch uh, sensor from memory here. I hope I got that right. So it's smaller than a crop sensor in a DSLR. So what that means is, you know, there's a couple of things that really drive cost of a narrow band imaging rig. So one is the cost of the filters. So if you've got a, a an ASI 1600 and as skinny as their filter wheels are, you can you can use inch and a quarter filters. So those are much less expensive than a two inch filter, which you would need for a crop sensor or a 50 millimeter filter you would need for a full frame sensor um, so there's that so it, and it's it's quite a bit of money really to to go to those larger filter sizes so there's that um, having a, a larger sensor means that you need a flatter image circle in your scope right so a lot of scopes are flat in the center but then out towards the edges uh, they have issues, so you need, you know, correctors of various types, uh, field flattener. Um, but if you've got a small sensor, then you're probably in the sweet spot anyway, so you may not have to worry about that. And then uh, also, you know, if you've got a bigger sensor, bigger image circle, then you need a bigger focuser, and things get big and heavy and, and more expensive. So it, it really is a, a cost advantage. Uh, of course, you have to think about your field of view and all that stuff, but um, it, it really is a, a cost advantage when you come to, to narrowband imaging with these smaller sensors. Okay, uh, so another topic I mentioned at, at the top, uh, you know, I, for many years, was doing a lot of stuff with long USB cables. I mean, we're talking like 25 feet or 50 feet. And the idea was that, you know, you could set up your rig out in the yard and then go in the house and sit in the armchair and, and run your rig from, from in the house. And while I figured out ways to make that work, you know, there's active cables and there's some gotchas. And then even with, if you've ironed out the gotchas, uh, there's some problems. So I want to share that pain with you. And uh, now we have some uh, options that are less expensive than they would have been at the time. So today, I would say it's much preferable to have a small computer uh, out actually on the telescope or, or on the mount or at the base of the mount or, or what have you. And uh, just talk to that via, via Wi-Fi or what have you. Um, so it might be a, like a Raspberry Pi or there's, you know, Raspberry Pis that are built into appliances or other appliance uh, computers that are, that are available. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so that's a, that's a better way to go. 
uh, you know, USB was never designed to be outside. It was never designed to have uh, long runs on it. And it certainly wasn't designed to have, uh, you know, you, I guess you could argue that you might have a bunch of peripherals with different power supplies, but they're all right next to each other, right, in, in, the, in the house. Uh, but when you start doing telescope stuff and you, you know, you've got your laptop on the end of a 50 foot cable and then you plug your laptop into an AC uh, outlet in the house is 50 feet away from where your, where your scope is plugged in, you could have a huge uh, problem. So I've got a slide here in a minute that will tell you, you know, how to make the best of that situation. But, you know, there's, uh, Basically, I've damaged a lot, a lot of gear over the, over the years, um, and you know the, the the least thing that happens is is you blow up your your active USB cable, um, but worse than that, you blow up a port on your laptop or blow up a port on your camera. Uh, that's not that's not good, and then. And I, I, I trust me, I've learned this the hard way. And and not only that, but then there's the mechanical risk, right? So you've got this 50-foot cable hanging off your laptop, uh, and if you trip over that thing, uh, you know you could pull your laptop off the table onto the floor. You could break mechanically break uh, your your laptop USB port. And again, I've got some tips around that, but. You know, I, I had one laptop, that, and you know, fortunately, it was uh, maintained by uh, my place of employment. But I, I think I went through five motherboards uh, on one <laughs> one laptop, and it was probably due to to my astronomy outings. Uh, so, don't tell them. But anyway, that's what happened. Um, let's see here. So. Yeah, laptop USB ports, you could get the mechanical damage from tricky, tripping over the cable, electrical damage from ground voltage differences, which could require a motherboard replacement. Uh, same thing with, you know, cameras on the other end or gear on the other end can get damaged as well. Uh, one thing to, that I did a lot of research on, on USB cables and extenders and different things. And there's some that use Ethernet cable to connect, you know, a transmitter and a receiver of USB. And and Ethernet uh, is designed with little ball, uh, not ballons, but little transformers that, that isolate uh, the different pieces of equipment from, from ground potentials. But even though these USB extenders, every one I've looked at, even though they use the physical cable for Ethernet, they're not actually using those transformers, uh, and so they don't actually isolate the ground. You can take an ohmmeter and, and tell that they're connected uh, to the same same ground. So they actually have the same uh, problem with grounding that the, these active cables have. So be aware, be aware of that. But if you're going to do this, uh, and this is good to know just for USB around your telescope in general, you know, if you're going to have a bunch of different power supplies, whether they be, you know, different batteries, batteries for a camera, different voltage for a DSLR or something, and 12 volts for the mount and dew heaters and other stuff, um, you need to be careful with how things are, are grounded. So basically, you want a common ground for everything, right? And so take these power supplies and take a voltmeter and first check to see if there's, you know, volts <laughs> already there, in which case you probably want to get a different power supply. But if there's, you know, only a, a few millivolts or less than a millivolt or something, then it's safe to connect the grounds together and that'll give you a a common ground uh, system and help solve some of these electrical problems that we that we talked about. You know, uh, um, and then you can connect all the all that supply grounds together to the to the ground lead on your on your AC or your mains or to the negative terminal of your your 12 volt battery if you're on battery. 
just just to illustrate this again, you know, learn this lesson the hard way, right? So I have long USB cable uh, out at the mount with the laptop, getting everything ready, everything's connected, everything's working right. Go in the house, notice that the laptop battery is getting a little low, plug in the laptop power supply, and boom, everything <laughs> stops working, uh, you know, because I've glitched the, the data line, uh, if not uh, blown it up. And uh, that's how you learn that the, the hard way if you don't have common grounds on everything. Uh, it does improve the data integrity, and uh, it helps protect your your cables and ports from damage because what what can happen is you know these these cables are not they're designed for data and even though they may have a thicker ground cable they're not designed to sync the voltage difference the current across two power supplies so you end up with your usb cables uh getting getting hot or something you know if you don't do this correctly okay um that said uh, in all the USB research I did, I did find this one device that um, is a is a USB isolator. And this one, uh, there's a bunch of them for USB two, and there's a whole confusing thing about super speed, and none of it sounds like what it actually is, uh, you know. But um, for USB three. Uh, this is the only one I found that, that does what it what it says uh, it it's going to do, and it does create a ground isolation between your laptop and all of the other nonsense. So I've tested it here at the house, and it works, and there's no problems with using it. Uh, I have not religiously used it in the in the field uh, to really, you know give it the acid test, I guess, but um, if you're going to try to protect your your uh, laptop USB port electrically, this is, this is the way to go, as far as I can tell. Okay. All right, and then for mechanical, uh, we, remember we talked about if you trip on your cable and pull your laptop off, uh, there's a company called Tether Tools, and tethering is the term for using your camera, your DSLR in this case, um, connected to a laptop, basically. That's what tethering means. So this company is called Tether Tools, and they make, uh, you know, extra special USB cables. And they also have this line of, of uh, products called Jerk Stoppers. So I've shown here some of the jerk stoppers uh, related to the laptop side. They also have ones. Well, here's one um, you can use on a on a camera, a DSLR. Um, so to protect the mechanical uh, port, the USB ports from getting damaged by somebody tripping over uh, a cable, you're still in. The laptop you're still going to pull it off on the floor but you hopefully won't damage the the USB port so there's that so we talked about you know the way to avoid all this nonsense of long USB cables is to have some type of computer uh, out on the mount now it used to be you know everything had to be ASCOM I talked about which is a Windows only um, but that's no longer the case with Indy and some of the other uh, things that are coming along. So, excuse me, now we have a lot more choices in terms of computers that we can put out on the mount. They don't have to be Windows devices necessarily. They could be as inexpensive as a Raspberry Pi, um, and they can either be an appliance that you don't have to think about all the software uh, Maybe it's even as simple as something you drive with your smartphone and it connects to the mountain focuser and, and whatnot. But so there's there's lots of choices uh, all the way from, you know, a Raspberry Pi up to a full on uh, Windows computer that's uh, purpose built 
uh, and even designed to be, you know, at a remote imaging location such that you can power cycle USB ports and power cycle these different power ports and whatnot. Since you're not physically there to unplug a USB port and plug it back in, they have a way to, to do that remotely with uh, powering the USB ports on and off. Um, I happen to settle on this HP Slice thing uh, for mine mount here. Uh, nothing special, astronomical about it. It's just I wanted something that, that could have like an i5 or an i7 uh, CPU in it because I wasn't sure what all I would want to do on that, on that computer. Uh, it turns out it's probably way overkill for most things but anyway that's that's what I did um, but there's you know lots of different lots of different choices out there um, so yeah you just need to think about you know does it need to be Windows or, or can it be Linux or Raspberry Pi uh, you know how much CPU do you need um, there you know there's those Intel uh, nooks and and uh, sticks and other things so do those atom processors have enough power uh, cpu power for what you want to do um, and uh, one thing so i still have not personally been to to uh, a big star party uh, and, but i'm told that at some of them they restrict uh, what you can do with wi-fi because they don't want just you know everybody to go nuts with wi-fi and then nobody can do anything um, so just something to think about if you're going to do this and you've got a computer uh, that you're dependent on wi-fi to control what happens if you get some place where they won't let you do wi-fi so that's just something to uh, you know, check with the star party ahead of time. Do they allow Wi-Fi or not? And if not, then what are you going to do about it? So uh, the other thing is Wi-Fi wise or just networking wise in general, I guess, you know, is there enough bandwidth between where you're going to want to control things and the computer uh, to do what you want to do? So I, I've just recently started using a 4K uh, monitor in in the house, a 50-inch 4K TV actually, uh, and it's means that I can open up all the different, you know, six pieces of software that I need. I can have them all open at the same time uh, and see them all at the same time versus flipping through through windows and and stuff. Uh, so that takes a fair amount of bandwidth. Um, also, you know, at the end of the night or the next day, transferring files and stuff takes a fair amount of bandwidth. So you think about how much how much bandwidth you want to use. Okay. Image acquisition software. Let's see what we have here. So, you know, there. I think there was like maybe three or four choices. Uh, I'm sure there's more that were there that I wasn't aware of, but I was aware of maybe three or four choices back in, in 2015, right? You had Backyard EOS and Backyard Nikon for your DSLRs. That was the go-to program, uh, but it was limited in terms of automation and things. Um, you know, I think I asked for the, the option to uh, stop your mount from tracking at the end of a sequence, which he added. Um, so that meant I could you know, image up to the, I could start it, go to bed, and it would image up to the meridian and then, and then stop. Um, so that was great for, for then, but, you know, I've moved on to Sequence Generator Pro, which will, you know, do an automatic meridian flip and keep going and all that stuff. At the time, uh, Sequence Generator Pro wasn't good with DSLRs. That has since changed, I'm told. I haven't used it with DSLRs, but it's supposed to be good. Um, and besides Sequence Generator Pro, and uh, there's so many more now. There's Nina, and there's Voyager, and there's the Sky X, and so there's lots and lots of, of choices. There's um, K-Stars, uh, which has a bunch of names. Uh, K-Stars, Eco, Indie, are all kind of the same open source, uh, all-in-one planetarium imaging, plate solving, focusing, auto guiding, uh, 
all in one, runs on a Raspberry Pi, etc., or Windows or other things. Um, and it's free, open source. I said, yeah. So there's that. Uh, besides the Backyard EOS and Nikon, there's uh, Astrophotography Tool, which is another sort of DSLR focused. Um, it can use some of the mirrorless cameras, which, because uh, he's reverse engineered some of that, although they are starting to. There used to be this thing with mirrorless cameras where they didn't offer a software SDK. They were positioning them in the market. You know, hey, if you want to do stuff with, if you want to tether, we talked about tethering. If you want to tether, go buy a DSLR because these mirrorless cameras are are cheap line or mid line, right? Now they're starting to to allow some some software with that. But before that happened, this guy that does the APT had figured out how to operate some of those mirrorless cameras across a USB cable. Um, yeah, so there's those, and then ones with lots of animation, automation, sorry. Uh, sequence generator is a real popular one. Uh, Nina is easy. It's not really all the way there yet in terms of sequences, because uh, you can't tell it, you know, start at 10:32 and end this target at you know midnight and start another one. Uh, it's not quite all there yet, but it, it's got some potential and it's uh, a lot cleaner interface than uh, than Sequence Generator Pro. Voyager, I don't have any experience with. Uh, it's supposed to be very good. Uh, it doesn't work with my planetarium of choice, which is why I haven't checked it out more more deeply. Um, maybe he'll add support for that at some point. Um, it is uh, supposed to be super bulletproof, so we'll keep an eye on that one. And then there's, you know, kind of the the high end. Although I don't know, Maxim DL I don't think has been updated in years and years. But uh, you know, the the observatories and remote hosting centers uh, that need a lot of of automation tend to use Maxim DL and and ACP. Um, so if you have if you have a full-on observatory with the dome and all that stuff, then maybe you want to look at look at that. But SGP can do a lot of that too. Uh, let's see what else have we got here. We talked about Raspberry Pi, Windows, Mac, Linux. There's free, open source, and commercial. Uh, so yeah, so you just want to think about the level of automation that you need. Do you want something that's all in one? Uh, do you want something that's open source or do you want something that's commercial? Um, so those are those are kind of the, the choices. But at the end of the day, these are the things that you that you want to do, right? So this uh, particular 5F concept. Um, so you want to find objects. So you need a, a planetarium program or maybe your imaging program uh, knows how to how to find things or go out and get uh, the, the the location of things across the internet or something. Um, so there's so there's that, uh, and that needs to talk to your mount driver, and uh, because it has a, a model of the the mount driver has a model of the the sky uh, that helps your your mount uh, stay on track. Uh, then you're going to want a plate solve, which is that comes from back in the day uh, photography was not film but glass plates with emulsion uh, glomped on there and you put the plate in the telescope and take an image and develop it and then you have this glass plate with a negative image on it and to solve the plate was to find out where in the sky that plate was an image of to a high degree of accuracy. So that's what plate solving is. And the reason it's important for us is one, to help you get on a target, because no matter how good your polar alignment is, um, how good your mount is, you're going to say, you know, go to M42 and it's going to go there and then you're going to 
take a picture and there's no M42 in, <laughs> in the frame and it's like right next to it, but you don't know that. Uh, with a visual scope, you know, you'd have a, a finder scope with a wider field of view and you could go, oh, it's right there and I'll just move it a little bit uh, with the handset in the case of a, a German equatorial mount. Um, but we don't we don't really have that uh, in in photography. So and we have all these computers and and stuff to help us. So we do plate solving. So what happens is you tell your mount to go to M42. It goes to M42, and you start plate solving. Take a picture. Uh, it says, oh. Your mount said you were pointed at M42, but I just figured out you're really pointed, you know, three or a hundred arc minutes off to the side. So then it sends a correction go to to the mount, and it does that in a loop until you're dead on uh, with your imaging target in the center of your field of view. So that's what plate solving is. And when I started, when that it's it's you know, fiddly to, to get working, or at least it, it was with some of the, you know, older programs. Man, when I got that working, that just totally changed uh, the hobby for me. I mean, because I was not a visual observer. I don't know how to star hop. Uh, could, you know, didn't know how to find stuff in, in the sky. And uh, when I could just say, you know, hey, go to M42, and then it just, boom, it's there. That just was huge. So that's you need plate solving. Okay, and then uh, to follow objects, you need the auto guider to improve on your mount performance. Um, and to focus on objects, you'd like to have auto focusing, and you'd like to control your filters. Um, and then, of course, you need to put all that together into sequences of exposures and, and filters. So these are the things that you want to think about in, you know, does the software uh, take care of all of that, or do you need individual pieces to do those functions? Okay, uh, we're making good progress here. So, speaking of uh, software, what I'll be using tonight is I have chosen to use Stellarium uh, Planetarium software. It's a free. Uh, open source program, and it's a uh, photo realistic. Uh, you can, uh, you know, have images of deep space objects in there. You can put your, uh, you can go out to your telescope observing location and take a picture with your smartphones, you know, a panorama, and then put it in the planetarium so and line things up so you know when things are going to be behind the house, behind a tree, whatever. Uh, I find that really val valuable when I'm planning and uh, also when I'm imaging. Um, I, I have uh, Orion uh, HDX 110, so I'll be using EQ Mod as my mount driver. Free, uh, it's closed source, but it's free software. Uh, I will be auto guiding with PHD2, that's free software available on multiple platforms now. Um, I'm using the, the Onag, so I'll be using some software called Focus Lock to do the focusing. I'll be using Sequence Generator Pro, uh, which does kind of every, everything else. Uh, and uh, I guess we could do some live stacking. Uh, you know, that's not a normal part of of uh, imaging I'm doing, normally doing, you know, long exposures uh, and not looking at them so much, uh, but we can take shorter exposures and use some software to quickly build up a, a color image, even though uh, I'm using a mono camera with filters. Um, and so there's search long and hard for this because it seemed like it should be there, but nobody seemed to have it, that capability. Uh, but there's some program called Astro Toaster, which is free, uh, which uses Deep Sky Stacker underneath the covers to put together a color image from either narrow band or RGB filters. So we can fire that up after we get everything else going. So that's the software we're going to be using here. And uh, hopefully the, the weather is holding. We'll, 
We'll check on that in a minute. Okay. Uh, oh, so another thing that has changed, speaking of Stellarium. So back in the day, uh, Stellarium by itself did not know how to talk to ASCOM mounts. It knew how to talk to some a few mounts with the serial cable, but not ASCOM mounts. Uh, so there was this little piece of shim software that some guy in uh, English in England wrote, Welsh Dragon Computing wrote Stellarium Scope, so you had to have that little piece of software. Uh, now, with the last couple versions of Stellarium, they do have an ASCOM driver built in, so you can forego the Stellarium Scope. And you can see here in Stellarium, you can see my observing location landscape in there. Okay, I guess there's one more thing to talk about before we get into the demo. Uh, planning resources. So one of my videos in 2015 was, you know, about books and online stuff and for, for how do you astro plan. So a uh, couple updates there. Um, I think the best planning software I have found to date is something called Sky Tools for Imaging, from a company called Skyhound. And I'm not going to go any deeper into it than just, you know, letting saying you could you can check it out. Um, but you know, it's going to show you so so much stuff. You know, what nights of the year are best for your target. Uh, when is it up and you know up above your horizon, and where is it relative to the moon, and how long should you expose for, and how big is it, and on and on and on and on. So it's just it's just got a ton of stuff. I'm still learning all the stuff that's in there. Um, so there's that, and then uh, with that, you know, I also kind of sanity check everything. Uh, I look in in Astrobin, which we'll talk about in a minute. I look on Wikipedia. You know, what are those what are those deep space objects look like? What have other people done? Uh, and then I, you know, sanity check in Stellarium. Uh, where are they? What is my FOV the right size for the object? And and uh, you know, when is it going to be behind a tree? And all that all that stuff. Um, so those are the the updated uh, planning tools that I've used since making those videos. There are many online resources, so I didn't take the time to to list them here. Uh, Cal Sky is one that comes to mind. Worldwide Telescope. I think there's Telescopius or something I get email from that suggests targets for my location. Um, you know, there's a there's a Everybody probably has their favorite, but there's there's lots of them, um, so you can just Google Google for that stuff. Um, but in terms of paid software, this is by far the most advanced. Is the Sky Tools for imaging? Okay. Speaking of Astrobin, if you don't know about Astrobin, I, I kind of cringe when I say it's sort of like social media for astrophotographers because I'm not a big social media person, but um, it's where most people post their astro photos. And yes, you can like them and comment on them and, and whatnot. But what's really powerful for, for me as a planning resource is, you know, you can search for not just objects, you know, like you could, well, what have people done? So I've seen a million M42s. Has anybody done one that's really different? Oh, look at that. You know, uh, so you could, you can search for objects. That's cool. And, you know, you could even search for, you know, hey, my FOV is this big. Show me the objects that will fit in my field of view, right? So you can do that kind of search. But you can also search for gear, because people are supposed to anyway, you know, when you post there, you're supposed to say what gear you use. So you could say, well, I'm thinking about buying a 12 inch truss RC and I'm going to think I'm going to use an ASI 1600 with that. So what, you know, what can I do with that? What have people done with that? So you can search for gear and then see what people have done with the gear before you before you buy it. So I think that's pretty, pretty powerful. So Astrobin is a great resource it's also just a great place to to browse around and see all the amazing stuff that's that's up in the sky um, so on the right here is um, 
my page as it looks right at the moment. Um, and, uh, you know, here's the one of the search inputs over here. So uh, there's a yeah, there's you can put up to 10 images, I think, for free. And then beyond that, there's a there's a charge and it's nominal. It's all good. OK. So getting close to the demo. So what has changed in my rig? since 2015. So um, this is what we're going to be using tonight. Um, it's, I call it semi-permanent. You know, I don't have a, there's still a tripod here that could be moved. Uh, I have moved this scope other than changing houses. I have moved this scope once to a uh, remote site and I, I won't do that again because uh, we're talking about you know 250 pounds of mountain counterweights and stuff just for the just for the mount but um so it's not on a pier so i call it semi-permanent so it's there it's out there set up all the time i have a cover for it um it's right down here on the tripod is the the computer um, and then I sit in my office slash studio slash control room slash workshop uh, and uh, control it from the comfort of my my house. Um, and I do that via via Wi-Fi. We dive in a little deeper. Let's look at what I, what I call the instrument package. So oh, so that's a that's a 12 inch. Uh, Truss RC, and I keep saying RC, so RC is the Ritchie Crichton optical design. Two guys back in the day uh, designed this particular optical setup. It's the same optical setup that the Hubble uses, and pretty much every big telescope after Palomar, uh, you know, uses the, an RC design. Um, it may be made up of segmented mirrors versus versus just a single primary, uh, but it's still, you know, the shape of the mirrors and the optical configuration is what makes it a, an RC. Okay, so I have a, you know, a 12 inch RC. That means it's got a 12 inch primary mirror and uh, it's, a, it's a truss RC, which means that it's, if we go back one here, um, you can see the, the truss pieces of carbon fiber truss here and there's more underneath this shroud it would normally without the shroud you could look right through it here um, so it's just to make it light and stiff and strong is the carbon fiber truss design so what do we have here so I mentioned uh, one of the projects I did in the last year was to to do a home built uh, rotator so that's what this belt is right here uh, and we'll talk about that a little just in a second here I guess and then we have there's a a moonlight focuser here uh, with its stepper motor to control the the focus and then we have the electronics for the rotator which I have since moved uh, off onto the onto the telescope because it kept getting in the way when I needed to take things on and off the scope here. Um, mostly inside the focuser and just sticking out the rear end of the focuser is my focal reducer. And then we have an adapter and the, the onag, that's that thing with the mirror in it, right? So the visible light comes through the telescope and bounces off the mirror, the cold mirror, goes through the filter wheel into the imaging camera okay and then the infrared light continues past the mirror to the guide camera here so that's how that all works and we just have another view of the other side of things here so you can see a little better there's the filter wheel in the in the imaging camera okay uh yeah so the the way the rotator works so the the moonlight focuser has the ability to manually rotate and the the mechanics of that are so good that it can be uh automated and everything stays 
collimated and, and aligned uh, so that you have good imaging even after you've rotated. And in fact, they sell a, a rotating kit to, to upgrade their uh, focusers to be rotating. And they also sell bigger, badder focusers <laughs> that are uh, have built-in rotators. Um, but I decided I, I wanted to build one uh, on my own. So I did a lot of uh, 3D printed parts and uh, with the uh, help of uh, good buddy Paulo, a uh, club member, uh, introduced me to Arduinos and, and did a, a circuit. Uh, so we've got that in there. And uh, so, you know, here's a the stepper motor uh, 3D printed mount to the focuser. And in this one, you can see the a gear on the stepper motor and then there's a 3D printed gear that, that friction fits on the uh, actual back end of the telescope. And then uh, in this picture, you can see the belt that connects these two gears. Uh, and so, you know, the, the gear on the telescope is stationary and you turn the, the focuser, I mean the rotator, uh, stepper motor and the whole focuser then rotates around the telescope on this on this belt that's how that works okay um yeah so you uh, i also have a refractor and i've arranged it so i can take that same instrument package basically from here back uh, from the 12 inch RC and bring it all up and put it on the back end with some spacers of the refractor and so I can get a, a wild wider field of view uh, with the same capabilities not the rotator but um, uh, I guess I could but I haven't done that uh, but you know focusing and uh, f focal reduction and the on ag and all that stuff and then uh, also, I, I can use that refractor with some other bits and pieces uh, to make it into a solar rig. So you'll see this dove plate on the top of the the RC, and and you'll see counterweights and in, in pictures in different positions, and that's because I need to adjust them differently depending on what I have or don't have on this uh, dovetail here. Okay. It's time for the demo. Let's see. Uh, don't have any questions. Maybe I'll pause just for a second here and uh, see if anybody has any questions they want to put in the chat before we dive into the demo. trying to account for the 10 second delay <laughs> for YouTube. Finish my coffee here. All right, I'll keep an eye on that. So let's get out a PowerPoint here. So now we're looking at uh, my telescope computer. And I was just going to adjust. There we go. The landscape brights, just so you can see what's going on here. OK. So my, my scope is in this long yard between two homes here. And so here's uh, Polaris. And this is where my scope is pointing in the home position. And here's, you know, we can rotate around wherever. This is the planetarium program, Solarium. We can rotate around and look at the, look at the sky. Um, so we have that, and let's see, we have a couple of other things that let us know what's going on. Um, 
we have. Oh, not on that computer. On this computer, <laughs> we have. Uh, I have an all sky camera, and the project that I did this week was I found this really great open source software uh, that makes it. Uh, you know, keeps keeps runs the runs the all sky camera, does the uh, auto exposure. Um, you know, it, it puts this uh, overlay on it, and I've got it pretty close. Uh, if you look at these two stars here, I've sort of got it pretty close, and you you'll see when we look at the star trails here and stuff, you can see that Polaris is in the right place. Um, so it does that. And it also does some fun stuff. There's uh, time lapses uh, every night. And then it does this thing where it takes uh, one row of pixels, or column, I should say. And it, it just makes an all-night picture of what happened in that one column of pixels. So that kind of gives you an idea of what's going on with the, with the weather. Uh, and then there's this fun um, star trails view too. So here's look at all those. So first of all, you know, here's there's some clouds, and you know, there's some star trails, and you can see that it's rotating around Polaris here. And then you can see all these planes because I'm in the pattern for for Oakland uh, Airport. Um, so fortunately that generally doesn't doesn't cause any any problems for me but the night after that it was cloudy all night so anyway it's just a really nice uh, and it was easy to set up uh, all sky camera so that just helps me understand you know do I have clouds do I have fog uh, and I can uh, go back there's an archive of of these images so I can go back and see what happened at 2 a.m. You know, oh, it, it was, it got foggy. Um, and then the other thing is I did a, a homebrew uh, cloud sensor. So this cloud sensors are just uh, infrared, uh, pointing at the sky, infrared sensors. Um, so there's the, the ambient temperature here in blue and the uh, sky temperature in uh, green here, and you want them to be, uh, you know, 15 or 20 degrees apart. Uh, ideally, the sky temperature would be like minus 10 degrees. And I think just because I'm parked right now, hopefully that'll that'll drop. But uh, uh, the the open sky should be about minus 10 degrees and then if you've got a cloud it'll jump up in in temperature interestingly enough uh, fog doesn't do that fog uh, is the same temperature as the the open sky and uh, detecting fog is a whole nother thing uh, involving lasers and backscatter and and stuff so that's a that's a project yet to be taken on but between this and the and the all sky camera then we're gonna know what's going on uh, one more thing uh, we've got a rain camera uh, so I can see what's going on with the telescope so we'll we'll fire that up in a second here so for instance I've already got everything connected let's just slew the scope just for grins here and let's double check and see if um wrong computer see if the mount is parked mount is not parked okay so if i want to go to say m92 so it just centered the planetarium on on m92 and then i can do control one and the scope is going to move to M92. So if I go back to this other computer and look at ring, there's the telescope moving to M92. And there's my dog going in the house. So 
So there's that. M92 is right next to the meridian. That's why the scope is pointing straight up. Okay, so let's get serious about doing some, some imaging here. So um, this is the planetarium program and we've used it to, to move the scope to a, to a target, although our imaging software could have done that as well. But uh, we're just gonna kind of do some things a little manually here to start us out with. So, uh, as I mentioned, the planetarium program now has its own ASCOM driver. So when you start Stellarium, it's gonna start our mount driver. And that's what that looks like. And I've unparked it. And then the next piece of software that we're gonna use is PHD2, which is the free auto guiding software. And uh, PHD2 stands for push here dummy because all you're supposed to need to do is click these buttons in a row down here. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's the idea. So you start here and you connect your equipment. So all of these uh, equipment choosers here, I'll just disconnect what I wanna, I can disconnect the rotator here for a minute. Um, so these equipment choosers, ASCOM equipment choosers work the same in all the software, right? So you have a, choice of different things to pick from. You know, I want to use this driver here. And then there's settings. Um, that you can set for the that are relative to that device. And then you say, Okay, I want to connect. Okay, and that's how all of those things work. So Okay, we're connected, so we can close that. And then uh, if you wanted to proceed down the row here, you can start looping the camera, taking exposures. This is the guiding camera, remember. Okay, so there's M92 off in the corner, and we've got some funny looking stars because we're not focused with the astigmatism. Um, and so if we were gonna keep going at this point, we would, actually we can do that because we're gonna use this to, to, to focus. So you're gonna pick, uh, pick a good star with this star magnifying glass. And assuming you're already calibrated, uh, then you just click the next one and bingo, you're, you're auto guiding now. So the mount, if we show this here, so the mount, see here it says hopefully you can read the small font track rate sidereal plus peck so it's tracking at the rate of the stars in the right ascension and it's also got the periodic error correction curve which i recorded uh, at another time running so we're tracking uh, with the mount and then this software is then going to send corrections to speed up or slow down uh, the mount in right ascension and uh, move the mount in deck uh, as needed to keep it more accurately tracking the stars. And you can see this star is nowhere near round. Uh, and when I start the autofocus software, uh, it will become more round, but it won't ever get to uh, a pure round ball uh, which has to do with that I have the, the, an RC with a large center obstruction and the size of my pixels and blah, 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 but uh, it, it doesn't matter. Okay, um, so if we're, let's see, did I start? I did not start Focus Lock. So Focus Lock is the software that works with the onag and an image from phd2 to adjust the focuser so we're going to connect it to all the gear 
And so this image right here is the same image that we saw of the star, selected star in PHD2. And what it's going to do now, you can see here, this is the uh, focuser in SGP, and we'll, we'll go through all the SGP stuff, but you can see here the position of the focuser is changing. So we're already, you know, we're using that real-time uh, focus control to get us get us in focus while we're while we're guiding here so we'll just let that run until it until it turns green okay uh, let's see so the next thing is uh, sequence generator pro so let's talk about that um, this thing is kind of a beast there's a lot of moving parts and that's why some people don't might prefer something like Nina but when it comes right down to, you know, if you want to do the full automation, then you kind of need all these, all these bits and pieces. Um, you can change this layout. So all these things around the edges here are, are widgets that you can pick which ones you want and paste them where you want. Excuse me. So these are the ones that, that I find helpful. And it's got two other main windows that you need to know about here. So one is the control panel. So for each of the major devices, the camera, filters, focus, the mount, plate solving, auto guiding, and then there's everything else. In my case, the rotator and a flat box. Um, you know, there's a tab in the control panel for each of those things with a ton of settings for you know how are you going to do your auto when are you going to do your autofocus when are you going to do your autofocus uh what are all the what are all the settings you know and there may be even um you know layers of of menus for some of these things um so that's the that's the control panel and then the other major window is the actual sequencer um so this is where you you have, you know, a sequence is a list of targets. So here's, I probably have way too many targets in a, in a sequence, but I tend to reuse a sequence for a long time. Um, so a list of targets, and then each target, you know, you're going to have uh, different events, which are lights and maybe darks and flats and you know those are going to have different filters and they're going to have an exposure length and they're going to have a bin setting and how many of them do you want and so this is where you you set up all that um, it's also where you connect your gear which is a little strange but this is where they they put it so again this is just like uh, if we want to do that rotator thing again right so if i disconnect the rotator then i can select you know well which rotator that i have drivers for do i want to use i want to use that one uh, i could click this to bring up that control panel for that driver or the settings i should say for that driver and then when i want to connect to it i can just connect um, so that's how that works so we have the the main group here is your your camera, your filter wheel, your focuser, your mount driver, and then these ones that are hidden here, flat box rotator, if you had a dome, if you had a safety device, if you had weather sensors, uh, that other stuff is down here. Okay. Um, so yeah, before we started, so I, I connected all those things. Let's see where we are. We're we're in focus now. It's just in and out of out of focus, I guess. So let's look at what we want to go and image. Um, I think I should have kept an eye on M92 if it went across the meridian while we were talking here. Um, what can I see? Stellarium. Uh, I told you I would just switch to using a 4K um, 
monitor. Um, so in order for you guys to see all this stuff, I wanted to do it back on 1080p again, but it means that it's all jumping off the edge of the screen here. Let's see if I can get it to come back. This is one of the things that is wonky with Windows. Okay, we still haven't crossed the meridian, but we're going to cross it pretty soon. Um, so we should probably jump on this before it gets too far past there. So let's look at uh, what I had set up here for M92. I was doing this for, for uh, one of the armchair star parties. So I was just taking short 60 second exposures in red, green, and blue. I would normally do uh, two minute or, or maybe even five minute exposures uh, with red, green, and blue filters if I wanted you know, RGB stars or I was taking a, a galaxy or something. Um, but for purposes of live stacking, I was just taking shorter exposures. And because the exposures were short, I asked for just a whole bunch of them. So it basically just goes forever. And then we have uh, rotate through the events. So rather than finish a row and then go to the next one, it'll, it'll rotate through the filters. So that's what's set up there. Um, I think we could just say run sequence and magically everything should just work, right? Okay, so it's checking the auto guider status. It's gonna stop guiding. Let's see here, it's, uh, it's stopped guiding. There's no longer a green cross there. Uh, then it's gonna slew to the target, which we were already there, but it's got a check. Okay, and then it's going to capture a frame and plate solve it. So I've got a 20 second uh, plate solving frame programmed in here. And I just started using a new plate solver, new to me plate solver anyway, and I'm going to forget the, the acronym. Um, it's like a ATSP or something like that instead of plate solve 2. And you saw it, it just happened in the blink of an eye there. It's so fast. Uh, Plate Solve 2 was the previous best in class. And uh, there's a that one has like a 10 second delay built in. So even if it solves almost instantaneously, you still have to wait at least 10 seconds. You can see here M92 is off to the side. So our go-to wasn't perfect. And uh, now it's, going to be in the center and so the plate solve happened already and it's moving on so it's resuming the auto guider so we can just go peek at that to make sure it does its thing so it picked a star so I'm not I'm not touching anything right this is sequence generator pro um, running PhD2 Okay, so now it's restarted the auto guider, so I can clear out this old data here. Okay, and it's waiting for the auto guider uh, to settle, which it has done. And so now it's set the filter for the first event, which was the red filter here. You can see the red filter here. And now we're imaging. Um, so it's taking a 60 second exposure of M92 with a mono camera. So it'll look like this uh, with a red filter. So that's the short version of that. Um, we can do some live stacking here as well. Why don't we just wait just a second here for this to finish so you can see. All 
Oh, and okay, so it's downloading that image it just took. There's the image it just took. Setting filter to green. Now it's taking the green exposure. Uh, so this down here tells us we're 10 minutes away from a meridian flip. Okay, so that'll happen on its own. A meridian flip is a complicated s sequence of stuff that has to happen if you think about it. Um, and this software does it all for you, so it could happen while you were sleeping and could happen multiple times as you jump between targets and all of that while you're not at your scope. So just off the top of my head, you know, it has to stop the auto guider. Well, first it has to stop imaging, then it's going to stop the auto guider, tell the mount to slew to the target, and since the mount knows that the target is now past the meridian, it's going to go back around through Polaris and come back at the target from the other side of the pier, which is the meridian flip, essentially. Um, then, you know, again, you've done a go-to on a mount that's not 100% perfectly polar aligned and level and super accurate, so you need to plate solve again. So we go through that plate solving process to get the target back in the center of your field of view. Then you need to restart the auto guider, pick a guide star, you know, get get guiding, get settled, and then start start imaging again. So Sequence Generator Pro and other programs that are fully automation uh, do all of that uh, for you. And if something goes wrong, then they have, you know, a plan to recover, uh, etc. Okay, so that'll happen as we talk here and now. Oh, actually, it's only a minute and 25 seconds away. So maybe we'll just, or, oh, that's, I'm sorry. I was looking at the wrong timer. It's still eight minutes away. All right, now we're doing a blue filter. So while that's waiting for the Meridian, auto Meridian flip to happen, let's, do this. I have all my Astro stuff in a folder. Let's do Astro Toaster. Again, free software. I looked long and hard for this. Um, start a new session. Select new folder. Looks like I was actually doing M92 for the armchair star party last time I ran this, but I'll just do it again. Uh, M92 lights. Okay. Save folder changes. So what this is doing, if I can get this moved. Uh, we want to monitor, we want to stack, we want to auto refresh, and at some point we're going to want to color adjust too. So what this is doing, and the reason you can already see an image is because it's, it's looking at images that, have, that were already taken of this target. You can see there's a little progress bar here, and it's red because it's redoing everything, basically. Um, but here's a list of all the the images that were previously in that folder. And it's using, in the background, it's using Deep Sky Stacker to stack all the red images and create a red stacked image and all the green images and create a green stacked image and all the blue images Where's that down here? Create a blue stacked image. And then there's a merge image where then it merges the red, green, and blue with the appropriate color treatment. And uh, there's your M92 live stacked. Not too shabby for 60 second exposures. And 
you know, I, I, you can do flat fields and other things, which I didn't bother. So there's some, some uh, vignetting and light pollution and stuff and gradients, what have you. But anyway, just for the purposes of the online uh, armchair star party, this was the quickest way to get a color image, right? Because nobody wants to, to look at the, you know, the monochrome image that shows in, in SGP isn't very exciting. Um, and, you know, people want to see color. Um, and I, I didn't, you know, I got rid of my, my color cameras. So um, that was kind of the only choice for for me and but and it's really cool that it also works for narrow band right so you'd be doing h alpha sulfur 2 oxygen 3 and then you could assign in the in the astro toaster program you could assign red green and blue to those filter colors and then it would give you you know a color uh, rosette or or uh, m42 or what have you uh, i guess m42 is not really narrow band but you get you get the idea um Pick your pick your narrow band target. And we're actually let's see, we're still catching up. I could have started it from scratch, but basically, you know, you get after only three sixty minute frames, right? You could have a color image and it would be a little uh, not not so detailed, and over time, as you add more images to it, it'll get sharper and and sharper um, as it goes along. So that's how live stacking works. Okay, um, let's just take a peek at. See, our guiding looks pretty good. This is near the meridian, so that our guiding should be really good there. And yes, I am zoomed out when I normally, I would be like this, <laughs> which looks a little messier, but that's what I care about, right? When I'm really serious about imaging, I'm gonna be looking at things at this scale um, where, you know, the, this is, plus minus two arc seconds. So I really want to be inside here. And here's another way to view that. Uh, this is a two arc second circle. And ideally I would stay inside the one arc second circle here. Um, so I would, you know, try to adjust things or, and whatnot um, to try to improve my guiding and keep everything closer in. But for the armchair star party purposes, it was better just to have a relaxed view of, <laughs> of things. And of course you can control the dimensions and stuff here as well. Uh, okay. Um, any questions again? I will pause for a moment here and see if anybody wants to type in any questions. I think we're gonna let it do a meridian flip here and we're still a minute and a half away from the meridian flip. And maybe we'll, after that, um, we can go and look at another target, I guess. The target I'm working on right now is not the bubble nebula, but the soap bubble nebula, um, which is a little more challenging. It's, um, oh, let's see. Oh, uh, we're doing the meridian flip. Okay, so, I'm normally asleep at this point, right? But we'll, uh, depends of course what target you're, you're talking about. But um, so I'm just gonna let it do it on its own just to prove so I, I won't go ahead and save the 30 seconds here. Um, so I assume about the soap, soap bubble 
Nebula. So it is near, I think it's near the Crescent Nebula, if I recall correctly, uh, right next to the Crescent Nebula. And it's just this perfectly round uh, soap. It looks like a soap bubble. And uh, it's pretty dim. So I've been collecting. I've got about 10 hours per filter. Uh, so now we're doing the auto meridian flip, right? So it um, turned the guider off. It's It uh, slewed the scope. I guess we're waiting for the scope to slew. If I'm really quick here, I could get my ring camera up again so we can see the scope slewing. Live view. There's the scope moving. Oh, how exciting. You can see all the security lights going on and off. The scope is moving. Okay, so it's going to come and point straight up again because it's at the meridian, but from the other side of the pier. Okay, so now we're going to plate solve to see if we're on target or not. Let me move this out of the way. And we get multiple dialogues. I guess I can't move that one. Like I said, I'm usually asleep for this part. <laughs> okay, so it's taking a 20 second exposure for plate solving. If you blink, you're going to miss the plate solve. And it's done. <laughs> Okay, and it says failed because we're not within 50 pixels of uh, where we want to be. So it'll repeat the process. And you can see M92 is off over here this time. So we're still pulling it into the center. It may take two or three cycles here. But again, this new to me plate solver is so fast. You know, the 20 second exposure is by far the longest part of the process now. Huh, it actually says it's solving. Well, I talked it up too much, huh? I did see a post on Cloudy Nights, or not Cloudy Nights, on the main sequence site that said that there might be a bug with this particular solver and SGP interacting if it doesn't solve quickly, that it doesn't uh, fail over properly to the blind plate solver a blind plate solver means that you don't have any hints about where in the sky you think you're pointing. And the way that SGP works is it has, you can configure two different plate solvers. You know, the one that's super fast that works with hints. And then if that fails for some reason, uh, then you can fail over to a slower uh, one that's more robust in terms of not having to be, you know, you don't have to give it any hints with where it is, but it then has to look through the entire sky. Uh, so it can take up to like 10 minutes. Um, so I'm surprised, and I can't move this dialogue out of the way, but I bet M92 is right underneath there in the center. The trials and tribulations of a live demo. So, 
So I could abort this and figure out what's going on, but that would kind of spoil the automation thing. And I did um, do what you're not supposed to do before a live demo, which was, you know, change something. <laughs> I changed and I did let it run for a couple nights first, but I, I did change the plate solving software. Um, so maybe there's more work to be done here. Um, I kind of hate to, let's see, can I turn off? No, I can't even do this while it's running. If I abort this, then Sequence Generator Pro is going to do a whole bunch of stuff to try to recover, and it's going to I'm going to be like fighting it if I get involved here. But I guess that's kind of what I need to do at this point. All right, bite the bullet. Abort. Yes. Okay, so you can see it's right there in the center. Um, let's just try to resume here and see. Well, first of all, hopefully we didn't run all the end of sequence stuff. Yeah, not tracking. It did run the end of sequence stuff. All right. Uh, let's see. So we want to get the scope moving again. So we want to center on target M92. So I do your own pack. So we are tracking now, and I bet this guy got disconnected from everything. So. Connect all that, close, start looping. Oh, that's interesting. Never seen that before. This is the new plate solver, ASTAP. All right, well, I am not going to try to troubleshoot this now. Let's, uh, I do want to try to collect some data before the the fog comes in on my target. So we'll try to move over to that before we call it quits here uh, for the evening. Um, what did I want to do? I want to look at the, don't see any fog. Coming in, yeah, see, when I moved out of the home position, this is the, the real sky temperature, minus 10, so that's no clouds. So that's good, no clouds, no fog. So I'm going to try to take advantage of this time. What's it doing? Is it still just stuck solving? Solving. All right, so we're done. We're going to be done with M92. And I bet it shut everything down again. No, this time it didn't. It's still tracking. All right, so switch to this is my. Soap bubble PNJU1. It's recently, uh, I think, 2018 discovered object, even though it's close to the Crescent Nebula. And I've stopped, as of last night, I stopped collecting H alpha data. See, I'm taking 10 minute exposures HAS2O3. I've got enough. Uh, 
H alpha. My my rule of thumb, I'm here in a white zone, right? Light pollution in the middle of a city. Light pollution is horrible. The way you overcome that is by taking lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of data. So what might take you 45 minutes at Little Uvis takes 10 hours, literally, per filter here. So I've got, you know, I've got a uh, little over 10 hours. I got 11 hours of HA data already, and so I'm just collecting some more because these are the S2 and the O3 are noisier than the HA. So I want to just get a little bit more data, S2 and O3, before I process that. So that's the plan. Um, so let's just see if we can just. So um, one of the things I learned recently about this, if you don't want to fight that auto recovery stuff, you can turn it off uh, by clicking down here where it says recovery. The only problem with that is I always forget then to turn it back on because I want it on when I'm not trying to manually operate things. Let's just leave it on. Okay, so the camera uh, cooler got turned off in that whole process. So we're going to tell it to start the sequence after the camera becomes cool. And so we're going to set it to minus 20 degrees in five minutes. Oh, actually, it just started cooling on its own. Okay. Uh, and we're slewing to the target. We can see that happening in... If I can get Stellarium to show again. Oh, didn't mean to do that. Okay. Yep, got two copies of Solarium running, sorry. This guy, ah, Windows. Come on, here. Restore. Let's get rid of this one. Sorry, excuse me. There it goes. Okay. Uh, so where's the scope? Should be right around in here somewhere. Uh, we can tell the planetarium to go to PNJU1. So it actually went out to, this is not an object that it knows about, but it went out to the Sinbad, Simbad uh, server and found it. So there it is. And if we zoom in a little bit, we see that the telescope is pointing near there anyway. So that's good. Let's see what's going on. Sequence aborted, guide star lost. Oh, and all this got disconnected again, so we need to connect all this stuff. Close, loop. That looks like we're not tracking again. Not tracking. Jeez. Okay, sidereal and pack, so we're gonna need to sequence aborted guide star lost. So let me just help this guy along here. Center on target.
see if this plate solve works now. It's been working all week on this target, so. see if we can see anything here. Do you see a soap bubble there? <laughs> I think it's pretty much there. We're pretty close. You won't see it until we do an HA. But it's, I think we're pretty much there. Okay, here comes the plate solve. and solving and it worked and we were right on target we were only 22 pixels away in one direction and 26 in the other okay so now if i say resume sequence everything should be just gunky dory we're still not to temperature yet so we'll delay start oh and now it's going to go and do the same thing all over again because I did it manually so now it's got to check solving done Zoom in the auto guider. Let's see if it picks a good star. I don't like that star, but it's too late to change it. It's my signal to noise ratio. That's just really low. Ugh. I wish you could just say go to there. Because what's going to... Oh, I know what I'll do. Here, let's do this. Can I turn this off now? Yeah. Okay. Turning off all the safety features. Now let's see if I do this quickly. There. Pick. Nope. Okay, whatever. Let's see if I can get it to pick a better star this time. And sequence generator disconnected everything even though I turned off the safety features I should have just ended the demo with M92 huh? <laughs> yep and we're not tracking sidereal Now we're off target. Let's pick a bright star. Maybe it will remember that, huh? All right, let's try this again. Mm. See, I'm fighting against Sequence Generator, all its safety stuff, even though I turned it off. And this is one of the reasons why I think people look for a better or different solution. Um, but I have yet to find one that is as good as Sequence Generator Pro that uses the components I want to use. Apparently there's no way around this. Oh, here we go. Well, 
one more time. Down to three viewers. <laughs> One of which is probably me, huh? That's okay. Yeah, so basically I'm just going to get it get it going again. Um, I guess I could show you this image that I'm working on. Let's see where we are here. Resuming the auto guider. Please pick a good star. Maybe I can pick one for you. Yes. What happened? Is it fast enough? Yes, that was fast enough. See, so we had a much brighter star. We have crazy high signal to noise with the ONAG 500 dB over 500 dB. But that's one of the issues is there's still some fine tuning that needs to be done with the PHD2 star selection in the case of an ONAG, I think, is why we're still having some issues there. But most of the time it works fine on its own. OK. Waiting on camera temperature. All right, so before I forget, we're going to turn the recovery back on because we've done all the steps that we need to do. So it, it'll just start when the camera cools off. While we're waiting for that, let me open Photoshop. So I'm in kind of a weird place. So I've, I've done uh, pretty much processed the HA as far as I'm going to process it. And then I did the RGB stars, so it's kind of weird. It's a monochrome image with with RGB stars, but that's where I am. Uh, but I just want you to see what this soap bubble thing looks like. Or I could show you on Astro Bin, I guess. But almost there. Um, I think it's that one. Yep. All right, let me drag this over onto the screen so you can see it, maybe. Come on. View, fit on screen. So like I said, it's kind of weird that we've got these RGB stars layered in over the top of the H-alpha with, with a star mask. But um, anyway, there's the soap bubble. Um, yeah, let me show you a finished one that somebody else did, which is how I became aware of it. So if we go to Astrobin. Bubble. And yes, we didn't look at Neowise because Neowise would have been behind trees for me here. Uh, oh, come on, it's not that close, is it? Really? Get this out of the way. 
Oh, <laughs> he drew a circle and says it's in there. Oh, I do see it in the image. It's pretty small. Let me let me get you a narrow band image here. Oops. Where's uh, Where's the image I was looking at? Oh, come on. It was just in the last few days. Or, well, no, because it's been more than that, because it's been... Everybody's got the Crescent Nebula in there. I want a close-up. Oh, well. Oh, there it is. Ah. There you go. I think that's a different crop. He did a different, different one. Anyway. Uh, well, yeah, I guess we could zoom in, huh? So this is the target that I'm working on right now. Isn't that cool? Just to bubble out in space. All right, so let's see what's going on here. So we are capturing, sorry about these menus. So we're capturing Event 2, which would be Sulfur 2, the 85th frame, 85th 10-minute frame. All right, so I'm going to let that run the rest of the night. Um, we do expect to have some clouds and fog coming in, uh, but no rain, so I'm going to let it run and uh, sequence generator will take care of things when uh, it stops being able to guide. It'll stop tracking and disconnect things, warm up the camera, which is how I'll find it then in the morning when I get up. So that's all good. So that's it for the live demo. Um, still don't have anything in the chat. So one more time, I'll pause here for questions. If you want to type a question in to the chat, uh, or we can call it a night. Let me pull up the PowerPoint. And... Where'd my camera go? There it is. Okay, I'm looking at the wrong screen. Okay, let me look at the chat window here. Crickets. Okay, well again, hopefully if you were watching videos from 2015, then... ...that weren't covered in the 2015 videos. And uh, this will, this um, event was recorded and it will be at the same URL that you use tonight, it will be available on the SJAA uh, channel, YouTube channel immediately. And I will also uh, tomorrow uh, take a copy of it and put it up on my channel. So either, either place you go, you will um, get to see this 
going forward. So there's the QR codes for the YouTube channels, uh, mine and SJAA's, and uh, you can find some more information about the imaging programs by me and Bruce, whose picture you see there. Bruce is at a star party tonight in uh, a likely place, California. It was to be the Stellar View star party, which was canceled due to COVID, but people could voluntarily, with social distancing, um, go and have a unofficial star party so that's what he chose to do um, so he's up there and uh, he does the imaging sig programs and i do the hands-on imaging so you can read about both those programs as well as see a slideshow of uh, images that club members have taken on that uh, on this link here uh, in this QR code, and uh, then of course all our publicly facing events are announced on Meetup, SJ Astronomy, link and QR code, and the club private events, uh, we have mailing lists or Google groups, they're all Google groups now, um, one for astroimaging and one for observers, visual observers. Um, where the club private ones are announced. And again, for only $20 a year, uh, you can join the club. So Wolf, uh, this our solar guy, says, uh, you know, for the price of a pizza, um, you can join SJAA and take advantage of all the programs and loaner program and a lot of good stuff. Um, so consider, consider doing that. Um, you can go to sjaa.net and look for the membership link. And I'm sure I had a link somewhere uh, earlier in the presentation part of tonight with the QR code. But anyway, you can find it at uh, sjaa.net. OK. I think uh, that we're going to call it a night here. Um, don't have any questions in the chat, so we will call it a night at this point. And, and one last time, this program will be available, both my channel and SJAA. Uh, you can see it on the SJAA at the same link that you used tonight if you want to go back and look at it again for reference. So thanks for attending. and. Uh, Good night, and we'll look forward to uh, another program uh, next month or the following month. I have to look and see where in the quarter we are. All right. Thank you so much. Good night.